So I want to take just a, a couple minutes to welcome you and kind of set the stage for the panel. Um, and then I'll turn it over to the panelists and the moderator. Um, so I'd like to welcome you to the inaugural uh, panel and a series of panel discussions. Um, so I wanted to talk about uh, briefly about the entire uh, series uh, of four panel discussions. Um, there's a great deal of complexity in education and educational reform. And faculty and curriculum and instruction in their scholarship look deeply into these complex issues. And we wanted to find a way to celebrate this scholarship and to share uh, this scholarship with a broad audience. And so we met in the department to formulate um, some issues that are both pressing current issues of um, educational context, as well as issues in which our scholarship could speak with some authority. After identifying these issues, faculty indicated uh, the panels they could be a part of, uh, many indicated more than one panel, uh, but in order to keep things manageable, we sort of limited it to one panel per faculty member, because we didn't want to have uh, panels of 10. Uh, so um, we, we were able to come up with some uh, manageable panels that, that dealt with uh, some pressing issues um, that we, we can speak, with, speak to with some authority. Um, and we were able to come up with panels that, that provide a diversity of perspectives on the issues that we're discussing. So looking at the, uh, the issues, probably couldn't see that very well, so this is a close-up of the panels themselves. Um, so this panel's, uh, series of panels will allow CNI faculty uh, to articulate differing and, and sometimes competing perspectives on pressing issues of education uh, in a format that will allow for a great deal of open and vigorous discussion. So unlike many talks where um, there are a few minutes at the end for questions, we wanted to have at least half of each session available for open discussion. Uh, of these issues. And so uh, distinguished moderators uh, from outside of the department will help to bring fresh perspectives uh, in examination of these issues and will help to guide these open discussions. So we look forward to a series of invigorating discussions and we certainly hope you'll be able to attend upcoming panels in addition to this one. Um, but now I'd like to focus on our first panel, which is uh, today's panel, uh, Should Testing Be Abolished? Um, so accountability has received a great deal of, of press recently, um, and there are many complex issues surrounding issues of accountability and high stakes testing, including uh, current uses and abuses of standardized testing in the United States, effects of testing on diverse populations, teacher accountability and the new uh, No Child Left Behind legislation, international and national comparisons, and the list goes on. I'll leave it up to the panelists to uh, say more about these issues, but I did want to say a little bit about each of the panelists before they speak, and I'll say a little bit about our distinguished moderator, Bill Trent, before the open discussion. So here are our panelists for today. As you, you can see them up there, or you can see them in person down here, either way. Um, so Sarah Lubienski is a professor of mathematics education and a former chair of the National Assessment of Educational Progress Studies, SIG, of AERA. Uh, with funding from the National Center for Education Statistics, she has used standardized test data to examine disparities in diverse students' math outcomes and factors underlying these outcomes. She believes that good national tests provide valuable information and can serve as powerful levers of reform. Sarah McCarthy is a professor of language and literacy and director of teacher education in this college. She studies the effects of policy contexts, including No Child Left Behind, on students, teachers, and teacher educators. She finds that when test scores are used inappropriately, schools are labeled as failing, teachers are maligned, and teacher education programs are condemned. But she wonders whether assessment can be salvaged to inform better instruction. Patrick Smith is an associate professor of bilingual education and literacy. He studies language literacy learning and human capital in and out of schools with a focus on Spanish English bilinguals and Mexican origin students. Migrant and immigrant learners are historically marginalized in US schools and he contends that current monolingual testing practices further limit their educational trajectories while providing teachers with little, little useful information. Professor Smith would abolish testing for emergent bilinguals and linguistically, linguistically diverse learners. So at this point, I'd like to invite Sarah Lubienski to start us off. And after each of the other two uh, will briefly present their perspective. Each presenter will have five minutes, um, and I'll be, uh, I'll be writing heard on them with a, a timer and everything. Uh, so that should allow us uh, for a good amount of open, uh, open time for discussion at the end. So with that, Great. I'll turn it over to Thanks. Sarah. Thanks. I'm getting a jump start before he starts the timer. So uh, <laughs> what good can possibly come from standardized tests? I'm not actually being sarcastic when asking that question. I want to start with a really mundane example from the National Assessment of Educational Progress. What's the length of this toothpick? So 
what is the length of that toothpick? Two and, a, two and a half inches. Okay. So there are two other popular answers that kids put down. Can you imagine what those might be? Ten and a half. Three and a half. Three and a half. Why three and a half, Adam? Uh, we have a number of eight, nine, ten. Eight, nine, ten. Right. So they're focusing on the lines instead of the spaces. So this is just a very simple example um, where only 20% of fourth graders got this correct. This was an open-ended item, so they wrote it in, and, and most kids did not get this. Um, but this helps reveal which parts of the curriculum need more attention from educators and researchers. And so that's one thing that standardized tests can do. Another thing they can do is they can spur policymakers to direct resources to students who need them. And Head Start was an example of that a few decades ago. Um, one could argue that no child left behind reporting could be, um, with schools having to disaggregate their data, might be another way in which um, there's something good in No Child Left Behind, despite all the things that I'm sure you hate about No Child Left Behind. Let me just give one very quick example of that. Um, we can argue about whether this is really causal, but um, in my looking at the data, we saw some gap, closure, gap narrowing and quite a bump there as No Child Left Behind did come into effect. Um, there are many who will argue about what that means, but it, it is something to be watching for and to looking at when we change policies. Um, I will also argue that standardized tests can counter deficit notions and highlight disparities and opportunities to learn. And I will also acknowledge that they can, uh, standardized tests can make um, deficit notions worse, but here's one example of how it could actually help counter that. If we look at where white students scored in 1990, it was 220. And if we look at the achievement gaps, it's very easy to think, um, wow, you know, the black and Hispanic students really are scoring well below that and they couldn't possibly reach that. But if you go over here to where we are now, um, those students are now outscoring where white students were before. So if you think about it in a temporal nature, there really are ways that we can enhance students' achievement. If we also look at affective data and not just look at achievement data on students, we can learn other things about what's going on in their classrooms. For example, students were asked how much they agree with the statement, learning math is mostly memorizing facts. And those of us in math ed land really don't want students to agree with that statement, particularly when they're you know, finishing high school. And there are real disparities in who agrees with that statement, and it shows some disparities in what kinds of instruction students are getting. Now I'm going to take a quick detour to Ireland. I went and studied their uh, rolling out of the math ed reform there. And it was very interesting that they have this leaving exam, which is basically like the SAT or ACT. ACT. It's what students would take um, when finishing secondary school to figure out where they're going from there. And um, when I would talk with teachers, it was clear that this was a high stakes test for students, parents, and teachers. They all felt this, you know, this is a very important test. So when the government wanted to change the type of instruction happening and change the curriculum, the big lever was changing the leaving exam questions. And then teachers were showing up to professional development on their own time in the evenings without extra pay. I mean, it was very astounding how much invested those teachers were in this. And it really brought home to me how, how in the US, some tests are high stakes for students, but not for teachers, and then vice versa. Um, and they would ask me, why do we let testing companies create our high stakes tests? Um, and we have this weird you know, system. And so we can talk about that, perhaps. A few closing additional thoughts. One, tests should be worth taking and should reflect what we value. I'll also acknowledge that they aren't always going to be able to catch everything we value. So I want my kids to be caring, happy children. That's probably not best measured by a standardized test, and that's a limit, sure. Uh, when interpreting results, we have to consider micro and macro structural inequities. So teachers should not just be the scapegoats. There are many other things going on. So if a teacher has low scores, there are lots of ways to look at that. We need to be looking at various levels. And if education researchers ignore standardized test data, others will gladly step in and interpret those for us. Um, so I will not argue that every education researcher needs to specialize in understanding standardized test data or liking standardized test data. But I do think we need some of us in the field who are willing to keep up on that and, and speak to those data when they come out and not just say those are stupid data and we're not going to talk about them. Um, there are things for further reading. If you're curious about anything I said, I could maybe direct you somewhere. And we're now switching to Sarah McCarthy. actually against testing per se. I have big problems with the misuses of test data. So I'm going to just talk a little bit about high stakes tests. And um, I wouldn't actually necessarily say that NAEP tests are high stakes in the way that I'm talking about them. 
But high stakes tests are tests that are used to make decisions about students promotion or retention, tests that are used for salaries, promotion or punishment for teachers, and many states use tests to recognize for high achieving schools or punish uh, low achieving schools. So what are some of the abuses of high stakes tests that I see? First, reduced time devoted to instruction. So much time is spent on testing and test preparation. Uh, neglecting important material and content areas, especially in the elementary schools such as science and social studies, uh, so the curriculum becomes very narrowed. A focus on lower order skills that are easier to measure. We've seen examples of classrooms that started doing hands-on interesting science activities until it got closer to the test, and then what do we do? We whip into worksheets. Um, I think we have seen negative effects on teacher morale as high stakes tests are used to evaluate them. And we actually have very little evidence that using bonuses, the carrot, or threatening teachers with the stick actually improves scores. S our students become increasingly anxious, and I think it's our youngest students who suffer the most often very small print in tests, or in the case of Park, not being facile with the computer, They're, the time constraints, and the individualistic nature of tests often undermine, undermine some of the kinds of things that, that we're trying to do. And we don't have much evidence that use of these tests improves performance of students. There are also, this is the new catch-all phrase, curriculum-based measurement. Uh, so the the advocates of curriculum-based measurement are saying these are assessments that can be ad administered frequently, they're predictive of later achievement, and they're very easy to use. So what's the problem in some ways? The frequency of use, the sheer volume of testing. So just to take an example from uh, Champaign Unit 4, the park tests, which some might claim are curriculum-based because they're aligned to the common core. Everybody takes those once a year. Then there's the MAP test, the measures of academic progress. These are computer adaptive achievement tests in math and reading. St students take those three times a year. Then the lowest 15% of students on the MAP get to take the Ames Web weekly for progress monitoring, and then the lowest 25% take these twice a month. Then we've got the wonders curriculum, which is not wonderful in my opinion, but uh, these have weekly assessments, math has monthly assessments. So, and besides this, there are many other kinds of tests and assessments that teachers use. So, you know, so my, uh, my biggest issues are, I've got one minute and 22 seconds, uh, that the data is often misused and it's, it uh, is used only to label kids or to, um, to evaluate teachers. And so I think these are misuses and I think there are possibilities for improving both the tests and improving how we use those tests and, and help teachers to interpret the data. So I'll give my time over to the next speaker so we can have more time to. Okay, I'm going to start um, with my conclusion. Teacher, this is crazy. Um, this is a quote from a Milwaukee Middle School student who um, was in a test for three hours hearing the test instructions read and the test questions read to her twice in English, twice in Spanish, and then with extra time for accommodation. Um, while the English-speaking students were out in less than an hour, she was in a test for that day for uh, more than six hours. So I'm going to be talking specifically about um, abolishing uh, high-stakes standardized tests for emergent bilingual and other linguistically diverse learners. Um, I think one thing to say is that um, such tests, I don't think they're helpful for any children in particular. However, I think in the case of emergent bilinguals, um, it's an example of gross educational negligence and in many cases, great harm. 
In the case of emergent bilingual students, you may know as English language learners, uh, standardized tests don't measure accurately what they purport to do. Um, one of those reasons is that um, language matters immensely in testing. In addition to oral and written instructions, most standardized tests require reading and writing in response to tests, often writing. Um, in other words, part of what tests are measuring is um, what students know about language rather than knowledge of a subject area. So here's just an example from a high school math test. Imagine taking this in Spanish or French or German if that's not your first language. Um, because standardized exams in, in the US are de delivered in English, uh, learners who are more proficient speakers of other languages are at a disadvantage then compared with speak learners who are tested in language they don't know well. Um, and Rudy Troikey, I'll go back to one, who was the first uh, president of the, the Center for Applied Linguistics and a former English professor here at the university, said that in a deep sense, language really can never be tested, uh, which means that when, we are when language is implicit on tests, it's extremely difficult to know that what is actually being measured. Um, about 22 years ago, uh, Guadalupe Valdez and um, Ruben Figueroa said, these tests that we had at that point simply are invalid for emergent bilingual learners. I would argue that we haven't really done a very good job of making those tests more valid. And that I would include people whose varieties of English are not those that are included on the test. So some consequences uh, of standardized testing for emergent bilingual learners. Um, increased retention, people staying back in grades. Um, testing in English only, which is the practice in most of the schools in this country, has this insidious effect, even in a state like Illinois or Texas, where you are allowed to test. Some standardized tests actually are allowed to be given in Spanish and other languages. Um, because um, tests at later grades are coming up or tests are seen as more valid in English by schools often are more valuable. Um, we find cases where people are sort of being pushed out of first language instruction in order to be able to prepare to take the test in English. And so um, we find that kids are being sort of pushed out of a language that they are able to use better for learning. Uh, in the case of the students I work with in Spanish, to get ready for a test in a language that they don't speak well yet, uh, English. Another effect is narrowing the curriculum. We heard a couple of examples from Professor McCarthy about the curriculum is narrowed. Um, sometimes in some schools in some states, and you can think of cities like Detroit, Atlanta, Houston, and a city that I was working in recently before coming to, um, to Champaign-Urbana, kids are hidden when test times come. Principals say, oh, well, you'll be in this grade next year instead of the one where you might be because we're going to hide you. That's a testing year. We don't want you to be tested. Um, in El Paso, for example, I think over 180 high school students from one school were told, don't come back. Right? This is a testing year. Um, the superintendent of that district is in jail. Uh, we know that at least a higher gradu excuse me, lower high school graduation rates, lower access to advanced placement classes, and students get labeled as college unready. Um, I seem to have, oh, I'm right on time then. So in fine, to, to really conclude, high stakes uh, standardized tests don't measure the achievement gap for emergent bilingual learners. I think they help create that gap. Um, and here are some resources I'd be happy to share with folks afterwards. Okay, yeah, Great. thank you. Just a, a moment to introduce uh, Bill Trent, who you can see here or there. <laughs> um, so we'll, we'll soon open it up for a discussion, but I wanted to take just a moment to thank uh, Bill Trent uh, for serving as moderator for the discussion. Uh, Bill Trent is a professor of educational policy organization and leadership. Uh, he served uh, as a member and also has chaired the visiting panel on research at Educational Testing Services and has been a member of the National Research Council Board on Testing and Assessment. He co-chaired the National Committee on Educational Excellence and Testing Equity. His research on inequality in educational outcomes has used standardized test scores to explore their role in shaping those outcomes. His research has focused especially on the use of assessments in determining access to quality educational resources and contexts. And so I'd like to turn it over to Bill, who uh, will probably you know, make, uh, make some comments and questions himself, but will also guide the discussion and invite um, uh, Anyone in the audience who would have a question uh, to ask that question of Bill or of the panelists? 
Um, and so hopefully we'll have a, we have quite a bit of time, hopefully we'll have an invigorating discussion. So if you're thinking of questions that you'd like to, to ask based on uh, what the panelists have talked about or questions that you have, and uh, we'll hopefully have a chance to, uh, to talk about all those questions. So I'll turn it over to Bill. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, <clears throat> I don't think I need to stand. Uh, I would like also to uh, just commend each of the presenters for uh, the expertise with which they, in five minutes, gave some very important points. Uh, to begin with, um, I'm still very much driven by my experience of working on the volume call high stakes, testing for placement, um, graduation, et cetera. I can't remember the rest of the subtitle. But that was, a, that was a great learning experience for me in terms of working with testing to follow up on my experience in working with educational testing service. The, the, the real concern I have is for the consequences of testing, consequences of assessment, as, the, as our presenters have said. And I think uh, the misuse and misappropriation of tests, especially when tests designed for one specific purpose are used for a different purpose. So we've gone through a period in this country where we've had assessments that are designed to assess students' learning and students' ability when those tests have been used for other purposes, and we've seen the consequences of that with the criminal activities that have pursued in Atlanta and in D.C. and other major cities where teachers have been held to the consequences of students' low performance. There are a number of issues like that. But one of the things I want to put on the table today is the question of what are we and what should we really be assessing? In many instances, we too often assess kids on materials that they have not been instructed on. The inadequacy of instruction leads to poor performance. And we know in this country, the distribution of adequate instruction is severe and critical. And it uh, is comparable to uh, holding people accountable for materials that they have not had an opportunity to experience. With those couple of comments, I want to open this up and ask uh, our respondents to comment on this issue of, on the one hand, appropriate test use. And I'll turn to Sarah first. <laughs> so, could you say a little more about what the question is? Well, when I think of appropriate test <coughs> use, um, one example I think is built into Patrick's comments, where we have assessments that are largely English-based assessments, and a narrow swath of English at that, as he's indicated in his. And we're assessing students for, who are emergent language learners on, on those assessments. Appropriate test use is also an issue of, of that leads to the misclassification of students, special education, because of the nature of the test that's used. And in too many instances, uh, as we pointed out in that particular volume, we're only using one instrument to determine a high stakes outcome for a student. Using one instrument to make a high stakes decision that will shape a kid's life for, uh, in perpetuity is, is really questionable in terms of education policy. So I think of those as particular instances, but also those instances in using standardized tests developed to assess students' abilities, which is often used to assess the way schools perform, particularly teachers. Uh, Ed Gordon and colleagues are actually pushing an idea of assessment for learning rather than assessment of learning and which suggests that there should be a different set of instruments. Hmm. Um, so I guess a few thoughts are, one, um, I think the ultimate goal should be to improve student learning. And so if that means <coughs> assessment where teachers and schools can look at the data and actually make use of it to better target instruction, I think that's an appropriate use of assessment. I am cautioned by the list of tests that the Champagne kids are taking. And um, so I, I'm very thinking about that as well. Um, but I also think this issue of it being a lever of reform is something that um, I think we should talk more about in this country. If, if, if uh, we know, you know, I guess as a research community, what good instruction might look like, is there a way to use tests to be that lever of reform? Um, that's an open question for me. Um, 
you also made an interesting comment about kids should only be tested on things they've had a chance to learn about. And that, that made me think about the SAT and how it's different than the ACT. And the SAT tends to be a little bit more about cultural capital, and I think it's trying to shift. Um, but I think that's a nice example of, you know, if you look at some of that vocabulary, a lot of kids just simply have never seen those words before. Why is that what's being used to keep them out of college? I guess so. Mm -hmm. Can we have what Sarah's comment suggests is, is that we can have to some extent assessments that drive curriculum as opposed to um, as opposed to tests that are more general like the SAT. <coughs> I mean, for example, people tend to say that the AP tests are much more <coughs> connected to curriculum than are um, the SATs. ACT, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, who would like to challenge that? To respond. That? Yes. <laughs> so, you know, I think that, that having curriculum-based tests is the right direction. Um, and I wouldn't throw away the NAEP tests. I really wouldn't. I mean, I think they do give us information. Uh, it's, you know, it's, again, how these are used. I mean, even the park test is at least trying to measure higher order things in a way that the old ISAT didn't. Now, whether they've actually gotten there is very questionable. There's lots of challenges with the park test. Um, but I don't necessarily think it's a bad test in and of itself. But then when we get to the point of saying, OK, the, these are the, your scores last year from the park test. And you know this is what happened this year, and you know therefore you shouldn't receive your bonus, et cetera, to a teacher. That that makes no sense to me. There are just so many factors that have an impact on teaching and instruction. So I think we ought to have assessments that can give us those kind of broad measures, like NAEP tests. And I think that we can have some assessments that can be geared towards improving instruction. And I just think our focus needs to be on how can the information help us improve instruction in a way that isn't, you know, we're going to test kids, you know, weekly or daily on all these kinds of things and not provide opportunities and time where teachers are actually teaching kids. Maybe I would just add, I think the things that uh, my colleagues are saying sound very sensible to me. Um, I think there's one issue in terms of um, emergent bilinguals that are often reclassified very early. We know from the research that um, it can take anywhere from seven to ten years to be um, strong enough in academic English in order to do as well on um, standardized measures as students whose first language is English have been educated only in English. So many states, including Illinois, don't like um, to allow students to spend that much time um, working on their second language English while they're getting academic content in their first language. So students are typically, in many programs, transitioned very quickly. They're reclassified. Um, we know from some research that's done by Professor Robinson in this college that the reclassification tests themselves aren't that good. And so we have another kind of appropriateness issue when we say, well, okay, they're no longer emergent bilinguals. Right? They're no longer English language learners. Now they're in the mainstream with everybody else. But in fact, what we know from those tests is probably they're not really ready for those, right? Because our ways of, of reassigning them to that category, um, politically popular but not cognitively um, working for those students. Each of you commented on the amount of testing and the consequences of the amount of testing for learning. Is the, could you say more about what those consequences actually look like? I mean, the, the easy piece that comes to me is simply the time taken away from instruction. That's one issue. But what about the breadth of curriculum that's covered actually given the nature of testing and given classroom time? Or uh, so you have the issue of the nature of the topics covered, the breadth of topics covered, subject matter covered. But, and also, what about the possibilities of the narrowing of the kind and quality of instruction that's actually delivered in an effort to facilitate student performance on the, on the test. A couple of comments. So one, 
uh, in a study where I looked at the effects of No Child Left Behind on writing in mm -hmm. particular, <clears throat> what we found, what I found was a real falling out of writing when the ISAT changed to no longer including the writing test. So, you know, from my perspective, the, <laughs> the bad news was that writing virtually disappeared in a lot of classrooms. And the only writing that was being done was the response to reading prompt on, on the reading test. So, so that's one issue. And I think we do find that there's less time devoted to you know, social studies, science, especially the arts, even recess. I mean, in the, in the times where there was this focus on we got to prepare for the test, we got to prepare for the test. I mean, elementary teachers, <clears throat> schools are actually saying, OK, no time for recess. We've got to use those 15 minutes for uh, more practice for the test. And you know, that is very disturbing to me. Just in terms of narrowing the curriculum, I'm thinking of um, a project I did with some colleagues at the University of Arizona. Um, we wrote an article called Raise a Child, Not a Test Score. And um, this was in early days. This was actually right when NCLB was starting and the state of Arizona had just started their own standardized uh, state test, the Ames test. Um, what we found in schools that were heavy bilingual or emergent bilingual concentrations was if there were a lot of poor kids there, their curriculum got narrowed pretty quickly. Um, they were some of the things that, that Sarah Especially, was talking about. Yeah. Um, in the high performing uh, dual language schools where parents were wealthy, lawyers, doctors, teachers, university professors, um, the teachers had a real um, support in the community and they didn't feel like they were going to narrow their curriculum. Their curriculum didn't get narrowed. And so I think one of the things we have to think about is whose curriculum is getting narrowed. And I think working class kids, uh, children of color, linguistically diverse, emergent bilingual kids tend to be um, living in poverty, and they tend to be in poor schools, and, and their curriculum gets narrowed more than uh, children in wealthy schools. Um, the Early Childhood Longitudinal Study has two waves, and so we've been able to, I have this, some Yahoos at this table sure. with me, I've been able to look at you know, the 1998 kindergartners and then the 2010 kindergartners, and you really do see the time spent on math instruction and reading instruction is way up. Uh, there was an article that used those data called like kindergarten is the new first grade. It's because of all the academic push down. But I feel like as a math person, I should be one to say, I, yeah, I think we're not spending enough time on other, other subjects. So. I've asked lots of questions. I want to give each of you a chance to chime in. I've got more that I want to ask, but um, we, you were invited to also contribute. So who has a burning question? And if you don't hurry up and ask it, I'll ask another one. <laughs> uh, yes. So how does standardized testing or testing in general go with the concept of differentiated instruction and choice-based learning? How do you tie those together? <laughs> <laughs> Next. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, uh, it's related. I'll, I'll make one comment, but um, I think we do have a tension in this country between a concern for standards and the ability to have kids, irrespective of the particular geographic, class, region, neighborhood, context that they are in, be instructed to a common set of standards. And achieve differentiated instruction. Uh, this has been a tension in the African American community. I grew up in a community where we said, you tell us where the bar is set, we'll figure out how to get over it, right? And that our teachers were committed to that, an all black school system. But I think we hear a debate today where local control in loco parentis or its academic counterpart is is having a rebirth. And so I think people are legitimately really concerned about what happens with standards and uh, how can I be driven by a set of national standards that are derived from a Washington or Princeton office when uh, this is particular to, my, to where my kid resides. And so we need that differentiated instruction on the one hand, but differentiated instruction, I think, should get kids to achieve at that standard. 
That's the purpose of during differentiation, as I understand it. I would agree. I don't see it as you're, that you're trying to actually change the curriculum for different kids. But I, I, the choice-based part is, I guess, something that's not in, I don't know. Um, one weird answer to that might be, you know, with computer adaptive testing, it does allow kids to enter and to, you know, answer more questions that are really, you know, the kinds of questions that are appropriate for them, which, you know, it seems like, in general, a good thing. And then when you start talking about uh, the map testing and how, you know, those could be used as a diagnostic test and then the information could be used to differentiate in some ways for those kids. But again, what happens is that they're just being tested over and over again and it's not clear to me that they're really adaptations to the curriculum or the kinds of support and scaffolds that those tests would suggest that teachers then use to support kids. A good example of that is Sarah's example from the map that uh, there was these measurement problems. Right. One, they don't use uh, zero as the starting point. And the other is that they count zero as a as, as unit, but we've known that Sarah for thirty years. Right. So if we really well, use that, we knew that, and nothing has changed. changed. Right. I don't know that nothing has changed. I mean, I think of all the you know the hundreds of teachers that have come through our program. I mean, it's clear we hit this in methods courses now. I think you know it's a slow change, but I I actually when I look at textbooks today, I'm like, wow, that. That's actually decent. You know, this lesson is actually conceptual. I, I think things are changing, but I'm, you know, I'm Pollyanna, so. Yeah, that, that was a while ago, though. That was, yeah, that because that's an old released item, so. I'm. Um, I just want to throw my two cents in about the whole concept of differentiation. And the thing I think that stands out for me in all of this is when you throw special education into the mix, you're looking at assessments way beyond. But the thing that is important for me is to distinguish between standardized assessments or, or and formative assessments. There are things, there is this assessment um, instruction cycle that every teacher should be sort of thinking about and what tool they use to figure out if their kids are getting the concepts that are being used. Those are very particular. You have to determine what those are. And for me, the whole concept of differentiation means that you're not using a standardized assessment to differentiate your instruction. You're using something that's a little bit more applied in your classroom. You're using something that's the, a, a different type of tool, something more formative assessment. So I think part of this discussion has to take into account how do we critique what's being used by a teacher to make judgments about how to regulate instruction and how to continue or how to back up or whatever decisions need to be made and also what's happening as far as broad measures of student performance and what, what's done with that. Yes. I wondered if you could <clears throat> say something about the growth of the opt-out movement and maybe what a teacher's role is in some of those efforts. One thing that I was reading and thinking about um, our panel here was the number of people who have opted out in some states and not in others. I think in New York State last year, 20% of parents opted out um, for their kids' elementary um, exams. It looks pretty, um, I mean, that's a big number. It looks pretty narrow to me in terms of the demographics. I mean, it tends to be white, middle class, English speaking parents that are opting out. Um, I think there are some, some exceptions in really pro more progressive school districts. I think Milwaukee is one. Um, Seattle and Portland, Oregon seem to be, um, have schools where teachers have actually been communicating with parents about this is what's being tested, this is you know, what the effects are on children. Um, I think it's a really interesting question. You know, what, if you feel that standardized testing or the high stakes use of those kinds of tests are not um, appropriate as an educator, what is your responsibility to communicate um, with, with parents and help educate parents about those. Um, I don't know a lot about that research, but I think it's a fascinating topic. A follow-up, I would 
add is that a lot of the opting out movement has come around the park tests or the equivalents in, in other states. And that it's, I think that that has a lot to do with the common core. So there's this idea about, you know, the common core is this government intended, government run program, therefore it's bad and the tests that are aligned with that, such as the park test, then that's when we're going to opt out. And I find that the opting out has increased so much since the Common Core and the park as opposed to the state testing where there was very little information about that and yet the tests were used in somewhat the same ways in terms of evaluating teachers and schools. Maybe one other thing to say about that. You know, in, in some nations, I'm thinking of the case um, in Soweto in South Africa, high school students have walked out um, of classrooms because they're not happy with different kinds of educational services. In this country, um, in Los Angeles in 1968, in Crystal City, Texas in 1976, uh, high school students have walked out when they didn't feel that um, school was for them. Uh, they walked out en masse. So I, it would be interesting to see um, with older learners, not just with teachers and parents, but with high school students and older uh, students in schools, what their reactions are to those kinds of tests. I think we're seeing a period of really strong youth activism. Um, I'm, I'm guessing that in different places around the country, people are thinking, of, do we want to sit for these tests anymore? In an earlier period in history, uh, there were two different walkouts in Chicago. We have two different dis dissertations done on that. Both Latino students uh, reacted and walked out of schools and African American students, both in Chicago. Um, this would have been back late 60s, Stafford? about then. So we have had that student activism responding to the quality of education that they were not getting. I, I was just going to say this is a different kind of level of opt out but I know with NAEP there's been a problem with 12th graders taking it seriously and there was a study where if you paid them would they do better and yes they did do better so I mean this idea that you know we're judging teachers on a test where again students could care less um, we just got our own kids' park results back like two weeks ago, and they were terrible, and I was mortified. And then she said, well, I spent the time doing, drawing a tree because the teacher couldn't tell us that it mattered. So, like, so it's, yeah, there's opting out at different levels happening. <laughs> there's a problem that predated opting out, which uh, didn't get a lot of national attention, as best I could tell. In response to No Child Left Behind, several states actually requested relief in the form of having the expectations for different race ethnic groups perform at different levels. You remember this? Yes. So Florida, Virginia, can't think of which other. I think Illinois went in to request an exemption. So in effect, you built in racial differences into the no child left behind, left behind standards. How much of what our aspirations are are defeated by policies that allow that? I mean, you know, what does that tell us about? So do you mean the exemption or the policy to begin with that requires the exemption? <laughs> <coughs> I mean, w when we decide that the standard for Asian students in Virginia will be 83%, for white students, it'll be 77, and for African American students, and so on, down the line, right? What is that telling us about instruction? What is it telling, and, and equitable instruction, uh, access to quality instruction, to educational resources, uh, and, and, and the intent and commitment to closing those educational gaps? he wrote with Sharon Nichols, um, Collateral Damage, about high stakes testing in, in America's schools. And he said, or they said together, it was Sharon's dissertation, but he's the co-author on the book, said, you know, when you have a measure that has such high stakes, right, somebody is going to be compelled to cheat. And there's lots of levels of different kinds of cheating that they document. So um, it doesn't surprise me that, that, that schools look for ways and states look for ways to comply and get the funding that's attached to it, but, you know, wiggle out of what the intent was. Or as Sarah said, hide kids on those days you're doing those assessments. 
or send them home. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Point, as much as kids went through a van and hide, and they and a bunch of their friends actually boycotted the test. They took them and purposely did poorly, um, and recruited each other to do that because they were really upset about how it was structured. So that happens, I think, a lot. Um, I want to connect to Lisa's comment, though, and I think some of this seems to me to be about trust of teachers in schools, um, because even as students and families opt out of some of the standardized testing, I think that the standardized test results are seen as more politically valid. Um, rather than the formative assessments that teachers use, that people sometimes think are objective and they're more cheating on those. And it seems to me the more we're moving to the standardized high stakes test, we're actually seeing more widespread cheating than if we try to put more place and trust in the professionalism to teachers and use more the formative assessments. So I think it's really interesting how it's skewed that we're doing things that I think are from a lack of trust of teachers and schools and principals and systems that are actually causing more of the cheating. Does that make sense, my point? Yeah. Yes. What do you guys think of that? And I think it links to what Lisa was asking about, too. I mean, I definitely agree. And, and so <laughs> one of my ideas, you know, that, of course, many other people have stated about improving testing in this country has to do with, you know, not using those high stakes tests for teacher evaluation. I think just eliminating that would help. I think more focus on formative assessments with professional development that's attached to that. You know, what are some assessments that we can develop as teams of teachers, as schools, that really will have the focus on improving instruction and will, again, put that back in the teacher's hands. But I think that could be accompanied by good professional development in terms of how do we use test scores? What do these kinds of tests mean? And how can we use them more effectively in classrooms? Sir, wouldn't we need some kind of alternative method, effective method to evaluate whether teachers doing their job and giving kids the opportunity to learn the things they should? I just think that there are other ways to evaluate teachers and that the, the sort of difference between uh, you know where a kid started and where a kid ended up you know that could be used, in my opinion, as a small part of the teacher evaluation. I just wouldn't go to this sort of 50% value added. I think that's way too much in terms of those. And but what are those methods? I haven't seen much in terms of effective teaching evaluation. Sure. So I have a couple thoughts. One is I don't think just because a test is multiple choice or at a computer doesn't mean it isn't formative. So I mean, I, I, one of the questions I have is, you know, is the MAP assessment or ThinkLink or those things that districts are using to try to regularly, you know, see what kids know, um, you know, is, is that worth the time spent? I don't know. It sounds like there's a whole lot of it going on. But I do think it can be used in a formative way. And I would also say that developing good assessments is really hard. And it's not clear to me that every teacher can spend the time to do that and that that's really what we want either. So I, yeah. The, but the best version I've heard of how to do teacher evaluation right does not look at, you know, what did, where are kids in the classroom or even how much did they learn in your classroom, but instead looking at slopes of prior classrooms and then the slope in your classroom. So I, I don't know how many of you I'm going to lose when I talk about slopes, but, um, you know, basically the kinds of gains a kid has had in other classrooms, and this only works if you have, you know, it doesn't work if you're in kindergarten, um, but, you know, if you're in higher grades, you, yeah, you can look at an individual kid and see what was their slope in the years before they got to you and what is the slope in your classroom um, and do that for all your kids and then look at that for multiple years and then I think you might have a measure that is somewhat defensible, but, you know, yeah, okay. Uh, Liz? I contracted to train by Discovery Corporations, which bought ThinkLink. Um, so it was called an interim assessment. It was formative in nature and yet had all of the psychometrics attached to it. Um, what we found was I trained the teachers to implement, to administer, and then actually to analyze the results of it. And the design of it was marketed to drive instruction. We would go in and talk to the teachers, and the first thing they would say is, can I read it to them on the math test? And then, can I read it to them in Spanish? 
So, and I said, this is completely dependent on how your district intends to use it, because it was predictive in nature, and it predicted first the ISAT, and then it predicted the results of the park. And my response to them is, do you want to know how they're going to do on the park? Or do you want to know what they know? <laughs> and it was totally different depending on where I went. If they were using it for teacher evaluation, which we highly discouraged, then it was a whole different answer than if they were using it and actually looking at the results and saying, these kids need this, these kids need this, and actually using it to drive their instruction. I thought if I were back in a classroom, I would have killed to have that instrument. Mm -hmm. But I would have read it to them. I would have read it to them in Spanish. And I would have made sure that my instruction varied. We found a lot of districts that it made no difference what the results were. The curriculum continued on. So while you were finding holes in the instruction and in their knowledge as they, as they moved toward mastery of the standards, you still had no flexibility to adjust your instruction to deal with it. In that case, it's pointless. Why bother? Why bother predicting if you're not going to be able to intervene? So I saw so much bleed over in what I saw in those K-12 classrooms, teaching those teachers between the language, the abuse of the use. You know, there was, there's just so many factors to the, the whole game. We have five minutes, and we've avoided addressing the question at the very top <laughs> of the page, should testing be abolished? But I also see two hands up, so uh, I think I'm going to defer to the hands, the young lady in the back, and then the young man in the blue shirt. This might bring up a topic for conversation at another symposium, but I want to go back to what you had said about with no child left behind. <coughs> and how states were actually adjusting their standards for various races. And that is incredibly indicative of the systemic problem that we're dealing with. And it's such a band-aid. Like there is, the idea, yeah, there, there are fluctuating scores that come from different racial, you know, backgrounds, but there's a, there's a reason for that beyond race, clearly. And if we're, if we're governmentally instituting a certain thing, such as No Child Left Behind and tests that are supposed to support it, and then governmentally allowing people to fluctuate their scores according to their students' performance, that is an incredible piece of evidence to the problems that we're facing. And it could be used as evidence for why the system needs to change. And so that's why I said maybe this is a topic for a different conversation. It's not about whether or not tests should be abolished. That's more about what's going on. Why are these test scores different? But bigger, like, why are we letting states do that? I mean, we talk about self-fulfilling prophecy all the time in education, and we're going to let states lower their standards for a certain race. Yes. I'm sorry, but I was shocked when you said that. I didn't know about that, and I felt like we needed to make well, sure we thought about that because that's incredibly scary thank you thank you yes somewhat related to the things that have been discussing what are your views on the value-added measurement that is uh, getting into you know practice these days to especially to evaluate school districts or teachers what are your views on that that relates to my slopes thing <laughs> so that you know i think when it's done in a way that really is taking into account the idea that there's many other things affecting instruction and we can't expect teachers to be, you know, the only factor in that and the only one responsible for that. Um, I, think, I think there are ways it can be done really terribly and I think there are ways it can be done defensibly, not necessarily, I don't know, well might be strong, but defensibly. Yes. Um, I have a question about the national and the colleges, why? I mean, why the was I mean, I know for when I got to college, the SAT, I had a certain level. And for any other agents, there was something level. For all of your and the minimum SAT score I had to have to be eligible to apply or to get into a large number of universities in this country 
was way different than I mean I'm looking at okay these obviously aren't official um, statistics that come from the university themselves. But when you look at a broad range and then you see SAT scores from local Americans that are sixteen hundred and for uh, Southeast Asians that are twenty three hundred and for Indians that are twenty two hundred. And these are, you know, like if I applied with a sixteen hundred, I would not have gotten in here. So why is that? Why do I have a roommate who gets in with a fifteen or sixteen hundred? Why do I have to come in here with a twenty two hundred? So I think some of it is, I mean, Illinois taxpayers want their Illinois students in, so I think the bar may be lower for, for that group. Um, and I think it could, I, I, it's, I didn't know about the different countries piece, but it could be that we have plenty of students for some places, and, and, and the thinking is we want more students from this area. I, I don't know. It's, I, I think it is an enrollment management kind of strategy. It's interesting. It's difficult to explain it. And, and in any other ways in terms of uh, beyond enrollment management. And, and by that we mean creating the kind and size and distribution of each freshman class and subsequent classes that, we, that, the, that a given university deems good for its institution. It's similar to why international students pay more tuition. Yes. You know? Yeah. David? We're, we're, getting, we're getting close to the end, yeah. but I did want to ask uh, one last question and go back to the original question that, that Bill was talking about. <laughs> but I'd like to ask it in a slightly different way rather than should testing be abolished. I would like to ask, if you had the power, what would you change? What would you, what would you make different about the accountability system than it is now? So you you have all that you you yeah. can make whatever change you want. What what change or changes you? So for the accountability system, I would I would do the slopes thing. Um, I also just in more general, I think our college entrance exam should be something that we as a nation agree on, feel good about. They're tied to the curriculum. I, mean, I think because we've been so afraid of a national curriculum that we haven't been able to have those conversations. I think with Common Core, it might be time to have those conversations. And so that would be another thing I. Think about. And I think I had mentioned some of the things not use uh, test results for teacher evaluation and until we get to the point that Sarah has talked about reducing the number and frequency of tests and focus much more attention on formative assessments that are really going to improve instruction and uh, support professional development efforts around that. In addition to those, I think I would immediately stop the testing with uh, high stakes testing with emergent bilingual learners and then a longer term have serious conversations with parents and teachers and educators and everybody about the consequences of those tests for all children. Do you want to make one last comment? Yes. Okay. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I think there are implications for what a college of education or a university has to do. I think there are some real disputes about and disagreements about misunderstandings about what knowledge really matters and how we need to be teaching people regarding what that substantive content needs to be. So I think there are implications for us as a community of thinking about how that teacher needs to be prepared and what that teacher needs to be able to do.